so a very good morning to everyone i dr poonam joshi welcome you all to our another uh, saturday head and neck attract academic session uh, today's presenter is uh, dr pratik chandrani he is a senior scientist in the uh, molecular oncology lab at attract navi mumbai he will be speaking on molecular genetics of differentiated thyroid cancers uh, with this i welcome dr pratik please go ahead with your presentation dr हेलो डॉक्टर प्रति हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल यस मैम yeah dr pratik you are there we can see you in the group hello just give me one second yeah हेलो डॉक्टर प्रतीक okay uh, good morning everyone uh, let me share my screen first can you guys see uh, my screen yes we can see is the presentation visible yes dr chandrani please go ahead just a minute my microphone is not working we can hear you yes now i can hear you actually i was not able to hear earlier okay okay we can hear you please go ahead with the presentation okay okay so uh, today i'll be talking about uh, uh, genomics of uh, thyroid cancer and uh, uh, for this presentation i'll be using two different uh, uh ongoing research studies uh, at uh, uh, our laboratory uh, so first of all let me introduce myself uh, uh, i am dr pratik chandrani uh, uh, lead of medical oncology molecular lab and the center for computational biology at tata memorial center mumbai and uh, i expertise uh, mostly into uh, computational genomics and uh, artificial intelligence uh in this uh, presentation i will first give you introduction to uh, genomics uh, as a, a field uh, and its applications in uh, cancer biology and then i will walk you through uh, the thyroid cancer specific uh, uh, genomic landscape which is uh, uh, which is a part of uh, you know recent development from uh, uh, our laboratory so first of all uh, acha during this presentation if you guys have any question in between please uh, feel free to interrupt or uh, no put... dr chandrani will be chair, they will be putting on chat box and will be taking them at the end of the class at then okay yeah okay. yeah okay so first of all uh, how cancer therapeutics has uh, uh, undergone paradigm shift uh, over the time that is summarized on this slide 
so in the pre 1990s era uh, majority of the cancers were used to be uh, classified based on anatomical uh, uh, location of the tumor and uh, uh, there was uh, little information available uh, in terms of you know therapeutic uh, decision making uh, uh, in this uh, era uh, mostly we used to consider whether uh, tumor is uh, easily accessible through the surface for surgical removal or whether it is uh, you know submerged into the deeper part of the body and we used to make uh, decisions uh, based on a set kind of uh, parameters uh, then uh, we started understanding certain molecular uh, features of uh, the tumor which includes uh, uh, presence of prpr and hot 2 uh, in or or ttf seven and so and so uh, all of these molecular markers uh, were used for classification of the direct part uh, therapy. What do I mean by a lung cancer tumor is positive for TTF1? We don't target TTF1 directly. There is no drug uh, for TTF1 because it is not a targetable uh, oncogenic driver. So uh, this, even though this classification in this era was driven by certain molecular markers, this is not uh, truly a molecular uh, classification era, uh, and this is not uh, a molecularly targeted uh, therapeutic era. Since uh, 2010, uh, uh, since the introduction of uh, mainly, sorry, uh, next generation sequencing machines uh, uh, in the uh, research and clinical field, uh, we uh, are into molecular classification era where each individual uh, driver oncogenic uh, alteration identified in a tumor is directly targeted by therapeutics. What do I mean by that is that if, it, if a tumor is mutated by EGFR oncogene, we will design a drug which will specifically bind to this mutant EGFR and not the normal form of EGFR, not the wild type form of EGFR. And in that way, this therapy is uh, highly specific to the mutant form of uh, the protein which is altered in the tumors only. That uh, uh, gives us uh, uh, advantage. In, uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, 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 profile each individual patient sample and make a catalog of all mutations that we observe in uh, a cohort of tumors and then we can systematically design a therapeutic solution for each of them. So this is a molecular classification era where it doesn't matter whether tumor is coming from breast tissue or lung tissue as long as it is mutated by EGFR. We believe that EGFR targeted therapy is uh, uh, for that patient. This is uh, very early to make an absolutely you know, unifying statement that uh, uh, irrespective of uh, uh, anatomical site and irrespective of histological uh, class, a molecular uh, alteration uh, can solely be used uh, as a classification mechanism because uh, uh, there has been some uh, complication observed uh, wherein that some molecular classes like EGFR uh, performs very well in lung cancer, but uh, they uh, do not show equivalent response in the case of breast cancer. So uh, there are still underlying uh, biological complexities which we need to understand why EGFR-driven lung cancer is responding very well and EGFR-driven breast cancer or EGFR-driven head and neck cancer is not responding as well as a lung cancer. So those kind of uh, 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 research needs to be done further, uh, but uh, by and large, it has been uh, observed across several different clinical trials that uh, 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 molecularly driven classification and therapeutic decision making is generally very helpful uh, in uh, giving better uh, uh, outcome, uh, better clinical outcome to the patient uh, uh, of any cancer type. Now, uh, uh, how exactly these uh, all uh, molecular classes are uh, uh, identified and how uh, they are uh, brought to the clinic? I mean, we know this is a very basic introduction. We start with a cohort of patients in which we perform genomic analysis to find out discovery of uh, therapeutic targets. Uh, after making the discovery of these therapeutic targets, we go through uh, preclinical uh, stages of development wherein uh, we use preclinical models or cell lines to uh, validate the findings and uh, 
uh, then it goes to the clinical trials and then we have a genomically informed medicine. Now the rate of these therapeutic targets is increasing exponentially and equivalently you can see that rate of uh, discovery of uh, uh, novel therapeutic compounds inhibiting any of these therapeutic targets are also going high and this is the time when NGS machine was introduced for the first time. So next generation sequencing machine uh, is enabling us to find out therapeutic targets with much faster rate and that is also helping us uh, improve uh, identification of uh, you know rate of these uh, novel uh, drug compounds. And of course, you all know uh, these drugs are uh, doing wonderful job. Uh, say, for example, in uh, CML, introduction of imatinib has resulted into uh, you know drastic reduction of mortality rate. And then uh, there was resistance to imatinib detected around this era. Uh, and the second generation drug uh, was introduced, which uh, further reduced the mortality rate. And it could going uh, on and on for third generation, fourth Sorry. generation, and so and so. <clears throat> Now, uh, to uh, do the genomic study, uh, we have to uh, uh, go through uh, a lengthy procedure uh, taking uh, roughly about uh, three to seven days. Uh, uh, why three to seven days? Because uh, there are various different kind of machines uh, with different capacity and uh, uh, and that's why uh, because of their variable capacity they take uh, variable time to do their entire process of uh, uh, next generation sequencing the most commonly used uh, uh, sequencer in uh, clinical practice uh, is uh, illumina uh, uh, mysic which is a, a small tabletop machine uh, uh, very rapid it can do uh, one round of sequencing within uh, two to three days uh, of uh, total preparation and uh, uh, it can uh, run in smaller batches of 12 24 samples so uh, you know uh, turnaround time is also much smaller uh, uh, on the other hand illumina novasic and uh, uh, high seek kind of machines are very large uh, they <laughs> hello there is some background noise Can I yeah yeah to yeah 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 uh, yeah please mute yourself because the because dr prateek will get interrupted in between so it is please request ever i request everyone to please keep, keep themselves muted uh, for the uninterrupted club. Sorry for that, Dr. Please go ahead. Thank you. So, so there are various uh, kind of machines with uh, different uh, mandate. Uh, a few of them are more suitable for clinical practice. Few of them are more suitable for uh, uh, basic research practice. Uh, but uh, all of them have one uh, kind of uh, you know uh, common fundamental uh, workflow. Uh, which I am uh, showing you on this slide, uh, and uh, this is universally applicable for, uh, in principle, all kind of uh, NGS machine with uh, small variability. Uh, even uh, if you consider very latest uh, uh, Oxford Nanopore or any other uh, latest generation sequencer technology, uh, there also the similar kind of concept will be uh, more or less uh, applicable. So this concept is that we start with DNA or cDNA. Now, DNA, we all know it comes from our cell and cDNA is complementary DNA. It doesn't come from our cell directly. Uh, basically, our cell has two kinds of duplication. One is DNA and second is RNA. We have developed almost all kinds of technologies which are more suitable for DNA and uh, uh, less suitable for RNA. So we take this RNA and convert it into DNA and that is called complementary DNA. It is the same sequence of RNA translated to DNA. So uh, it is very easy to find out from which RNA it is coming from. So that is called complementary DNA or cDNA. So these two are our starting material in all kinds of NGS application. Now this DNA uh, is very uh, large in size. A human genome is about 3 billion uh, nucleotides, 3 billion base pairs. And that is divided into a set of chromosomes. So the largest chromosome in our body is also a 250 million base pair. 
So uh, uh, most of our techniques are not uh, uh, friendly to uh, work with uh, such a, a huge piece of DNA uh, or cDNA in either case. So what we do is we take this DNA or cDNA and uh, cut them into fragments. Uh, this fragmentation can be a mechanical fragmentation where we apply you know a physical force uh, to break down the dna or we use acoustic uh, uh, sound waves uh, to break up uh, or we use enzymes uh, proteins which are uh, you know uh, able to cut dna at uh, a regular interval and so and so there are various different mechanisms for this uh, but either way our target is to obtain a dna fragment of roughly about 300 to 400 base pair in length. Once we get a 400 base pair fragment, then it is very easy for us to set up the whole molecular reaction, whatever kind of reaction we want to set from it, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, Illumina NGS or whether it is uh, Sanger sequencing or, uh, you know, any other such kind of application. Now, from this fragment, it is very difficult to uh, perform a molecular reaction because of a reason that sequence of this fragment A fragment B and fragment C is different. These are coming from three different regions of the DNA. And this DNA is a 3 billion base pair uh, long. So uh, every time we do the fragmentation, we don't know what exact sequence of each of the fragment is going to be. So what we do is we put a universal adapter on either end of the fragment. Uh, three prime end and uh, five prime end of the fragment and this adapter sequence is known to us. So the nucleotide sequence ATGC, ATGC of the adapter is uh, known to us and thus that enables us to design sequencing primer. So after this adapter what happens is that our sequencing primer will come and bind to this part and it will start sequencing in this way. So the sequencing reaction will actually read fragment C it will start from this junction and our primer will bind to uh, this location. So uh, this adapters allows us to do uh, uh, a lot many different kind of uh, uh, you know, molecular reactions onto uh, the DNA fragment uh, without even knowing the sequence of the DNA fragment. So in this way, uh, now we have a universal primer which will come and bind to either side of this adapter and that primer will allow us to uh, read the whole fragment uh, of DNA which is inserted between a couple of adapters. Now, uh, 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 about a million uh, different kind of, uh, you know, uh, such fragments are there. We put them all onto a, a glass slide, uh, which is a normal uh, slide, like a microscopic slide, uh, of, uh, you know, roughly about same size, uh, but it is uh, actually a biosensor slide. So it has uh, a complementary DNA ligated onto the slide, which are complementary to one side of the adapter. So these adapters will come and bind and stand in a uh, position uh, like this onto the slide and <clears throat> each of the adapter will be uniquely uh, identified by high resolution camera on the NGS machine. So when we put this slide onto the NGS machine, there is a high resolution camera here which will read each of the fragment being sequenced in the real time. So this entire process from starting with DNA or cDNA to preparing this slide is called NGS library preparation. Why library? Because there are millions of fragments being prepared at the same time. So we call it NGS library uh, preparation. Once the library, uh, library is prepared, we put it onto the uh, NGS machine where actual sequencing happens. <coughs> From this sequencing, what we want to identify Uh, is a, a cancer driver alteration. Now, a cancer driver is a type of uh, DNA alteration which uh, which actually drives the tumor growth and uh, it promotes the tumor transformation. And uh, a non-driver alteration is a type of genetic alteration uh, which is also observed uh, along with this uh, driver alteration in the same tumor, but uh, those uh, non-driver alterations are not able to uh, transform a normal cell uh, to a cancer cell, and non-driver alterations are not able to drive a tumor growth by alteration of uh, uh, molecular pathway.
so we perform a set of uh, uh, you know biological experimentation on uh, uh, healthy normal cell lines uh, to confirm uh, which of the mutations are driver and which of the mutations are not driver but uh, what kind of mutations are expected i mean even before we jump on to uh, its uh, potential to drive the tumor or not we need to understand what kind of nucleotide changes uh, have been reported till now and how uh, they affect uh, uh, the analysis of ngs so on this slide what we are looking at is uh, uh, a type of you know four different uh, alterations will will go through but these are not all kind of genomic alterations once you uh, sequence a genome of a uh, patient, we uh, we get uh, n number of different alterations, uh, and uh, uh, this complexity of four different type of alterations goes uh, uh, so high that it is difficult to cover all of them in a single lecture. But here I'm uh, showing you four most common and uh, four most clinically applicable alterations which are already in clinical practice. So one type of alteration is called single nucleotide variant, in short, SNV. Uh, a classical example of SNV is EGFR L858R mutation in lung cancer or BRAP V600E in melanoma and several other cancers. Uh, in this uh, uh, alteration, what happens is that single nucleotide is altered uh, at a particular location. And this single nucleotide alteration results into single amino acid change. Say, for example, on this EGFR protein, where in about 950 uh, you know, different amino acids are there, amino acid number 858 has converted from L to R. Similarly, on this second example of BRAP, amino acid number 600 has uh, converted from V to E amino acid. Now, the single nucleotide variant is very disastrous to the protein function and, uh, and thus it is also a uh, potent uh, uh, oncogenic driver. So, the single nucleotide change on uh, EGFR enables uh, a rapid binding of, uh, uh, of the ATP molecule and uh, a rapid uh, uh, downstream signaling activation uh, through phosphorylation and this single mutation uh, doesn't uh, allow EGFR to control its activity. So, this downstream signaling of uh, phosphorylated methylase pathway activation, which actually drives the tumor growth, is now uncontrolled. And that's why this is a oncogenic driver alteration. Okay. So, this is SNV, single nucleotide variant. Another type of alteration is called indel, which is a short form for insertion or deletion, in which two or more than two nucleotides, but up to 50 nucleotides, not more than 50. Two to 50 uh, nucleotides are either inserted or deleted. Here it is deleted and here a new uh, piece of uh, uh, you know, uh, DNA is inserted. Either way, uh, it changes the protein sequence. And the change in the protein sequence is again disastrous and uh, it leads to <coughs> uh, cancer kind of transformation. A classical example is EGFR exon 19 deletion uh, for lung cancer. So in EGFR exon 19, uh, 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 there are uh, uh, you know about 20 different exons, uh, 22 uh, out of which in exon 19, 15 base pair, one five, 15 base pairs are deleted, and the deletion of those uh, uh, 15 base pair. Uh, uh, alters the structure of uh, EGFR protein in such a way that the uh, uh, structural part which is involved in uh, control of the EGFR protein uh, activity is now not able to uh, perform that uh, controlling uh, step. So uh, that results into again uncontrollable activity of EGFR uh, phosphorylation. Uh, which activates uh, MAP kinase pathway and activation of MAP kinase pathway always leads to uh, a higher growth rate, uncontrollable cell division and uncontrollable cell growth. So uh, that's why this EGFR exon 19 deletion is a driver alteration. Another type of alteration is a gene fusion in which two different genes which are supposed to be far apart in the human genome are coming together and they are fusing together uh, and this fused uh, gene is producing a single uh, protein 
uh, uh, called uh, upheaved protein. And uh, a classical example of uh, such kind of uh, cancer alteration is EML4 ALK fusion or BCR ML1 fusion in various kind of leukemia. It is also reported in uh, few solid tumors. So uh, these uh, alterations are actually, uh, you know, uh, altering the uh, regulatory activity of these uh, uh, downstream protein. Say, for example, ALK is a kinase. A kinase activates uh, MAP kinase pathway. And this ALK is highly regulated protein. But when EML4 is fused with ALK, it is an entirely different kind of protein for our body. Because our body, our cell, has never seen a protein which is made up of you know, these two different kind of proteins fused together. So the regulatory mechanisms are not able to bind to this protein. And they are not able to uh, perform their regulatory uh, function. So this fusion is again uh, providing uncontrollable growth signal. And that's why it is classified as the uh, driver alteration. So there are several different kind of gene fusions have been reported. All of these are very commonly reported across all kind of uh, tumor. And the last uh, type uh, that we are going to see today is uh, copy number variant in which uh, uh, our genome has either amplified uh, uh, or you know increased the copy number of a particular oncogene or it has decreased is the copy number of a tumor suppressor gene. So a classical example here is a heart replication in breast cancer, uh, uh, which is you know uh, a very well established the therapeutic target. So now in this copy number change, what happens is that uh, our genome has two copies uh, of each of the gene. Uh, each of the copies coming from each of the parent. Now these two copies are highly regulated uh, because all of our regulatory mechanisms are familiar with uh, you know controlling two different copies of every gene. But uh, in a cancer cell, in a somatic cancer cell, uh, genome is duplicated. So instead of two copies of the genome at certain location on certain chromosome, we have four copies or eight copies. 10 copies. We have seen certain tumors in which a particular oncogene has 50 copies, 5-0, 50 copies in a single cell. Now, any regulatory mechanism will not be able to handle 50 different genes at a time because they are uh, not uh, designed uh, to perform their uh, uh, you know, regulatory mechanisms uh, in such a case. So, uh, because of this, uh, you know, uh, higher number of copies, uh, now a more number of protein is produced uh, that again results into uh, hyperactivation of uh, uh, downstream signaling pathway. And that's how a uh, copy number variant is also uh, classified as a uh, driver genomic alteration. So these are the four common uh, type of genetic alterations, uh, which are uh, very well established into clinical practice. But uh, please do not misunderstand uh, a genomic level complexity in a somatic tumor cell is far, far, far beyond than this four type of alteration. And that is also far, far beyond uh, from a single uh, lecture. So if anyone is further interested, feel, uh, please uh, feel free to contact afterwards and we can you know, definitely dig more uh, into that direction. So after looking at four different types of alterations, let me show you uh, how we identify all of these uh, alterations uh, from a typical sequencing experiment. So we start with the reference sequence. A human genome has been sequenced uh, uh, since past uh, you know 15 years uh, and uh, this sequence uh, is uh, universally uh, you know uh, released uh, by a consortium called genome research consortium grc and uh, they they keep revising this genome sequence so at present at present uh, the latest genome sequence version is 38 so our reference sequence is GRC H H for human because the genome research consortium release uh, sequence for uh, various different or organisms uh, for human it is called GRC H. 37 or uh, 38. 38 is our latest version number is of now. So every year or every year or two years, uh, they uh, keep doing more and more sequencing of human genome and they keep identifying some uh, some hidden part of the genome. But uh, at present, you can say that almost 99.9% .9 of the human genome has been very well sequenced and very well characterized. Uh, you know, only small portion uh, has been left over and we keep working on it and uh, maybe in uh, next few years, even that, uh, you know, very small uh, fragment will also be uh, sequenced and will be known to us. So this is our reference sequence. 
and this is our sequencing data this is how it actually looks like this is a cartoonistic representation but even if you look at the real world data this is how it will look like okay so uh, on each of the dna fragment uh, we had adapters on both the side if you remember from the previous slide and on the adapter primer bind so here one primer did sequencing on this side and another primer did sequencing on this side and some middle portion on each of the dna fragment is left over so that uh, middle fragment uh, is left over on this uh, on this fragment of the dna but if you look here uh, different fragments have different uh, uh, you know region missed out and if you put all of them together every single base pair is sequenced at least uh, you know x number of times so uh, none of the dna fragment is completely left over so this is uh, the concept of uh, shotgun sequencing which is a, a you know a mathematical concept wherein if you take 3 billion base pair and randomly chop them up uh, and then sequence everything almost every part will be captured in, in at least you know x number of fragments and that x number of fragments uh, are mathematically calculated and planned in the molecular reaction in such a way that we get our desired x number so in this particular case uh, this x number uh, let us look at the numbers here uh, this is total 18 uh, at this particular location so this 18 x is called coverage of the sequencing or depth of the sequencing which signifies how well we are reading a particular piece of dna in a clinical setting 500 x coverage is a, a standard uh, uh, you know recommended uh, uh, depth of sequencing uh, for research setting, uh, this is variable depending on the uh, hypothesis uh, that we are testing. But whatever that number is, uh, out of total 18x, here we see uh, two different nucleotides at a particular location. Uh, A is counted seven times and C is counted 11 times. So our allelic ratio <coughs> of this mutation, mutation from A to C is 0 0.6, which is roughly about 50% of the DNA molecules have reference A base pair and roughly about 50% of the DNA molecules have altered form of C base pair. That signifies a heterozygous uh, mutation. That means that out of two different copies present in our cell, one is altered and second copy is intact. That is called a heterozygous mutation. Uh, and this is an uh, example of point mutation. Now, in this second uh, uh, example of indel, you see that some piece of DNA is missing. There is no orange bar here that indicates that uh, uh, there is a, a deletion of a certain base pair uh, from this particular location. If this deletion is longer than 50 base pair, then this is called copy number variation. If deletion is less than 50 base pair, uh, you know, between 2 to 50 base pair, then it is called indel. Now, in this copy number variation, what is happening is that entire portion of the DNA a huge portion harboring a particular gene has been deleted either both the copies are deleted or single copy has been deleted one copy is present so these are called homozygous deletions or hemizygous deletions similarly if there is more than average number of reads at a particular location then that indicates copy number amplification or copy number gain in which more than two copies of a particular uh, gene is present and this is again a type of copy number variation so this is called copy number gain or copy number amplification. Now in this portion, what is happening is that our NGS data is aligning in part to chromosome 1 and in part to chromosome 5, which is only possible if chromosome 1 and 5 has fused together in the DNA of our patient. So if we get this kind of sequencing data, then it indicates a gene fusion event or a, a translocation of a, you know, uh, uh, very different genomic uh, uh, location. And that uh, is how we identify uh, gene fusion uh, in a tumor cell. Now, if we identify any uh, NGS data, which is not mapping to the human genome, but it is mapping to any of the pathogen genome, say, for example, a human papilloma virus, then we can, you know, uh, uh, highly confidently uh, identify any pathogen uh, and, uh, you know, use that for uh, therapeutic or prognostic uh, classification as per the requirement. So this is the underlying uh, you know, uh, rationale for uh, uh, for NGS data analysis. 
now uh, let me go to the main slides so uh, i'll take um, maybe five more minutes uh, uh, so thyroid cancer sinus classification we all know uh, uh, and the thyroid incidence is increasing uh, all across the globe uh, and that is uh, very well known now uh, so more and more thyroid research is required and uh, 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 when we started this study, uh, we could identify only two or three different uh, genomic analyses across the globe, and those are not directly useful to us. In the downstream slides, I will explain exactly how. Uh, so in India, uh, nobody has sequenced the thyroid cancer genome at all uh, with the comprehensive NGS uh, application. So uh, we started with the profiling uh, papillary thyroid, uh, anaplastic thyroid, and medullary thyroid in uh, our laboratory. Uh, first of all, I'll show you this uh, medullary thyroid uh, cohort. So uh, for medullary thyroid, we uh, collected uh, uh, you know, uh, 31 patients, uh, fresh present tissues, and uh, we performed uh, whole exome and whole transcriptome sequencing uh, of these tumors with uh, 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 appropriate coverage for research applications. Uh, uh, now across the thyroid cancer tumors, you will get to see the tumor mutation burden uh, is uh, roughly about uh, uh, 1.2 uh, on an average. In few of the patients, you can see the tumor mutation burden is going a little bit high, and in few of the patients, it is going very low. So what is this tumor mutation burden? Is that we calculate total number of mutations observed per MB, per mega base pair, or uh, per 10 raised to 6 nucleotide of the genome. And this is a good indicator of overall complexity of a particular uh, genome. And uh, this is also a good indicator for uh, you know therapeutic response in uh, uh, immunotherapy uh, uh, in various different tumor types. So uh, higher tumor mutation burden, uh, more than 10, is a, a generally used cutoff uh, for immunotherapeutic response. And here this data shows that uh, thyroid, uh, medullary thyroid cancer particularly, is not having a higher tumor mutation burden. It is uh, perhaps uh, one of the lowest tumor mutation burden disease, uh, and uh, thus uh, it is not uh, uh, highly, uh, you know, uh, complex disease as well. As you uh, you must be already aware that uh, thyroid cancer prognosis is uh, much better. Thyroid cancer cure rate is also much better than uh, several other uh, solid tumors, and that is in part explained by this uh, genome of the thyroid disease. Uh, this genome is not highly mutated and that indicates that this genome is not highly aggressive as well because higher number of mutations will uh, increase overall chance of alteration in you know multiple different oncogenes which will increase the complexity of the tumor which will increase the aggressiveness of the tumor so uh, medullary thyroid tumor rate is very low now out of all the tumors that we identify we classify putative somatic alterations and putative uh, germline polymorphisms and you can see that their uh, allelic uh, fraction is uh, uh, drastically different it is a highly significant difference between the germline polymorphism and somatic uh, uh, alterations and we take all of these somatic alterations and uh, perform their uh, further analysis uh, wherein we identify that uh, red uh, uh, is uh, uh, most commonly observed, uh, driver alteration, <coughs> sorry, uh, across the cohort. So in medullary thyroid, red alterations are present at about 48% frequency, which is uh, very similar to what has been reported in the literature. And then you get to see that these are the hallmark alterations of uh, 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 you know, thyroid diseases. Uh, these genes are expected to be found in any typical sequencing experiment, and we are able to capture all of them, which includes red, NRAS, KRAS, uh, HRAS, uh, MIRAP, at uh, you know uh, variable frequency uh, across the tumor types. Furthermore, uh, we get to see that several different novel genomic alterations are also observed in uh, thyroid cancer, and a few of them are very interesting. So, for example, BSN. Uh, BSN is a, a targetable. Uh, you know, epigenetic uh, 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 marker, and uh, we see thyroid uh, patients, so three different thyroid patients positive for uh, BSN uh, alteration. Similarly, NOT3 is also uh, uh, clinically relevant alteration, NOT3 is also clinically relevant, and several other are there. Now, interestingly, what you get to see is that this overall frequency of uh, the cohort is uh, drastically different 
is drastically different when you make two different groups uh, of uh, medullary thyroid. Uh, one group is red mutated, all of the patient samples here are red mutated uh, patient samples and all of the patient samples here are red negative. Okay, so uh, if you look at their clinical data, uh, all of these red mutated patients don't have any particular, uh, you know, clinical parameter uh, enrichment. But if you see their molecular profile, it is drastically different. So, for example, these three genes are never mutated along with red. They are only present in red negative cohort. And these genes are always present uh, in red positive cohort. So there is a preferential bias between uh, you know various different genes to be mutated based on a very well known driver alteration rate. This is the first time we are observing that a single driver alteration may alter the whole mutation landscape in a particular disease. So we started digging more into this and we uh, took all the genes and identified their pathways which are altered uh, between red positive and red negative cohort. And we see a completely different molecular pathway driving these two different tumor types. In red positive cohort, we see long-term potentiation pathways. We see HPV infection related pathways to be highly upregulated. And uh, these are these patients are negative of HPV. So this, these pathways are not actually driven by HPV, but maybe red uh, alteration is contributing to activation of this pathway. This is further uh, to be tested and validated. We haven't yet uh, confirmed this finding, but it seems like uh, uh, this is how it is uh, happening. On the other hand, in the red negative tumors, those pathways are not active and we see transcriptional misregulation uh, to be uh, highly active uh, in, in all of these uh, uh, tumor patients. So uh, this explains uh, uh, how uh, uh, you know, uh, molecular landscape of a particular disease can help us understand uh, the mechanism of, uh, uh, you know, uh, action in this tumor. Furthermore, uh, we take a whole transcriptome data and we identify rate mutations here. So these all are rate uh, mutated patients and these all are rate negative patients. And these are the molecular pathways uh, which are known to uh, be altered in uh, various different tumors. So let me show you a zoomed in view. Uh, these are classical uh, pathways uh, as uh, hallmark Keras pathway, uh, hallmark uh, uh, mTOR pathway, uh, hallmark uh, uh, and uh, hallmark big uh, target pathways, and so and so. So now here, what we get to see is that in the red negative cohort and positive cohort, certain pathways are highly uh, activated and certain pathways are not so activated. And this uh, differential uh, activation of pathway explains their different biology involved uh, in the tumor. So say for example, all the red mutated tumors are highly active uh, uh, for their uh, glycolysis. Uh, so their, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Warburg effect will be more potent in, in these uh, red driven tumors as opposed to red negative tumors. Uh, mitotic uh, 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 signaling is also very active in red positive tumors. So uh, overall mitotic cell division is also supposed to be uh, highly active. Uh, DNA repair pathways are also uh, highly active, uh, observed uh, to be highly active across red positive tumors, uh, which are not present in red negative tumors. So such kind of uh, pathway differences uh, were observed for all of the red uh, versus red negative cohort. Furthermore, when we look at the tumor microbiome, uh, tumor uh, microenvironment of these uh, uh, patient samples, what we observe is that uh, in the red positive and negative cohort, we see overall similarity of tumor uh, microenvironment. And this similarity driven by uh, these four different cells. Uh, uh, T cells, CD4, 9, NK cells uh, uh, of the resting stage, macrophage M0, again resting macrophage, and T cell follicular helper cells. These four are highly uh, uh, enriched in uh, tumor microenvironment of uh, uh, typical medullary thyroid cancer, and this is irrespective of red status. So at least we know that red uh, mutation is not driving uh, changes in the tumor uh, microenvironment. Uh, of medullary thyroid cancer. But uh, overall, what we get to see is that uh, macrophage M0 is very interesting here. So let me again show you a zoomed in view. So macrophage M0 uh, are uh, the resting uh, macrophages. It can be, uh, you know, uh, it can be induced to the stage of M1 or M2. 
and this uh, m1 and m2 has uh, differential uh, you know uh, implication on the clinical outcome of, of the patient so here uh, we can use uh, uh, drug compounds which can uh, you know convert uh, m0 to m1 and that can be more uh, you know uh, beneficial for the uh, patient sample and uh, uh, that can be one uh, therapeutic strategy for uh, medullary thyroid cancer furthermore uh, in uh, red we get to see that uh, uh, overall microbiome of uh, uh, medullary thyroid is uh, uh, similar uh, in red positive and negative there was some difference observed but this was non significant difference so we conclude that overall uh, medullary thyroid cohort has uh, a more or less similar uh, microbiome diversity this diversity is uh, assessed by uh, Shannon diversity index which is uh, uh, which is you know a mathematical algorithm to find out uh, how complex uh, a diversity of uh, microorganism is uh, present in a particular tumor uh, in this uh, tumor when we look at red positive and negative uh, with the differential enrichment of microbe uh, what we get to see is very interesting let me again zoom in so here what i'm showing is a fold change difference on one axis and significance of uh, you know p value on uh, uh, y axis <coughs> these lines indicate <coughs> the cutoff value so any uh, value which is uh, you know lower than uh, this left hand side uh, uh, dashed line is uh, having uh, depletion of the uh, uh, microbe and anything which is higher than the right hand side uh, dotted line is uh, indicating enrichment of uh, uh, microbial count and uh, any uh, microbe which is uh, above this uh, horizontal uh, dotted line indicates it is statistically uh, significant. So we get to see that certain set of microbes are uh, highly enriched in red positive tumors and certain kind of microbes are highly depleted uh, in a red positive tumor. And uh, uh, this is the first time we are seeing that a particular uh, oncogene affects the microbiome of a tumor because if you if you try to you know recollect from the uh, basic studies a microbiome uh, or you know microbiome is basically a set of uh, microorganisms present in our uh, body at a particular location and this uh, is uh, very typical of uh, each and every uh, uh, individual tissue uh, every tissue has uh, its own characteristic uh, uh, set of microbes present and those set of microbes are highly beneficial for various kind of functions uh, 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 on the tissue so uh, this uh, set of microbes are supposed to be uh, you know uh, a common across all kind of thyroid tumors because uh, because this is uh, coming from a thyroid tissue a healthy thyroid tissue and this is not a part of tumor per se but what we get to see here is that a single oncogene red is a changing microbiome in the microenvironment of this uh, patient sample in this microenvironment if you recall from the previous slide our immune cells are not characteristically different, but number of microbes and their uh, amount is different. Now let us look at how they are different and how they are uh, associated with uh, uh, some of the clinical parameters. So here uh, on this uh, heat map, what I'm showing is a same set of microbes which are highlighted here. Uh, which are you know significantly enriched or depleted the same set of microbes are shown here and uh, this is the relative uh, abundance of these microbes so red indicates high blue indicates low now you get to see that in red negative uh, these all microbes are very high and in red positive uh, these microbes are higher in nature and these are depleted uh, in their abundance now this is not uh, observed to be associated with any of the clinical parameters say for example age or death status or uh, uh, tnm stages or performance status and so and so so we know that these microbes are not actually uh, associated with any clinical uh, parameters but they are actually affected with uh, associated with only red mutation status now a red oncogene is uh, altering a microbiome and that's a very complex link that we are you know further investigating uh, to find out the mechanism how a oncogene is affecting a microbiome uh, change uh, but it is uh, you know uh, one of the very interesting observation and uh, why this is interesting is because uh, some set of these microbes are uh, very well known to be uh, pro-tumorogenic say for example 
this uh, osculospirum uh, bacterium is uh, uh, very well known to uh, you know uh, give signals uh, which are uh, supportive of tumor growth so uh, whether this uh, uh, enrichment of tumor uh, is driven by this microbe or whether microbe is driving the tumor we don't know that link yet okay we don't know whether red is enriching this uh, microbe or whether a uh, microbe is enriching the red mutation that's the uh, uh, unknown link as of now in our study which is a part of, a part of you know investigation but this is uh, the first time we are observing a tumor oncogene associated with microbe so uh, that's very interesting uh, outcome uh, from the medullary thyroid cancer study furthermore we get to see that uh, red mutations are uh, highly enriched in uh, you know uh, different sexes uh, particularly uh, it is uh, uh, highly enriched in uh, uh, female uh, as compared to uh, the male population and uh, that makes uh, you know red targeted therapy uh, uh, more important uh, uh, you know for all the female uh, patients and these red mutated uh, patients also shows uh, overall poor survival compared to red negative uh, patients and we hope that with the help of red targeted therapies uh, at least survival of these patients can be improved far beyond the blue line so uh, we we hope that but uh, that needs to be further tested uh, in indeed settings in the caucasian it has been shown that uh, these patients are highly benefited with uh, red targeted therapy <coughs> so uh, that is uh, the landscape of medullary thyroid now i have two three more slides to show the papillary thyroid data this is a uh, slide uh, for papillary thyroid uh, data from china uh, from european countries from uh, american uh, studies have shown that uh, uh, mutation frequency across all different uh, oncogenes is highly variable uh, across the globe and this is you know one of the interesting uh, observation uh, uh, which uh, you know motivates us to perform more detailed analysis in each and every part of the world including india and we need to do uh, you know uh, indian uh, profiling to find out which oncogenes are uh, you know uh, better suitable therapeutic targets for uh, our patients so now here i'm showing you some data of uh, one of the phd student vaisakhi who is working under uh, the guidance Uh, she has done in detail uh, sequencing of uh, papillary thyroid cancer, and she has identified all of these uh, hallmark alterations, uh, all other kinases which are relevant to uh, the you know uh, classical uh, cancer alterations, and she has also identified uh, germline variants uh, uh, in the uh, somatic setting. And one of the very interesting here is DUX2. Uh, we'll get into a detail of that uh, in later slides. Uh, she also performed uh, a copy number analysis and uh, identified that uh, overall genome of thyroid is very stable uh, there is no uh, high enrichment of uh, copy number uh, except only few spike in uh, at various different genomic location <coughs> so now this uh, uh, is two uh, is a uh, is a gene which is known to uh, affect the thyroid function uh, in general uh it is uh, involved in thyroid differentiation and metabolism so uh, dux2 has been uh, already characterized for normal thyroid tissue functions and some of the germline alterations of dux2 have been also reported uh to uh, uh say for example congenital hypothyroidism or thyroid dishormone uh, hormonogenesis have been associated with the ux2 germline alteration uh, in the children so uh, this ux2 uh, has already well established the function and role for various thyroid associated uh, diseases but it has never been reported to be affected in a thyroid cancer in a somatic setting so this study is trying to uh, find out whether this uh, you know uh, ux2 gene can uh, drive papillary thyroid cancer or not so uh, what uh, uh, you know we look into is we find out all the duf2 altered uh, patients of the clinical association studies and we uh, find that uh, all the mutated patients have uh, you know much uh, uh, poorer uh, uh, clinical outcome 
uh, they have you know uh, magic force much higher than uh, the other patients and this is also uh, uh, you know highly invasive so all the mutant patients are uh, more invasive in nature uh however i mean this study is uh, you know uh, limited by uh, you know a small number of patients as of now and more number of patients should be added further uh, uh, in the follow up study but uh, this data indicates that there is some uh, some kind of you know clinical uh, outcome association of the ux2 uh, alteration and uh, apart from the ux2 we also observed here that uh, there was a whole landscape of brap ras uh in this uh, patient sample so we uh, further make uh, two groups here uh, which are you know brap ras driven patient samples and independent of brap uh, uh, and ras uh, patient samples and we identify all different kind of uh, you know uh, parameters in between two of them a few of them are uh, uh, significantly different and few of them are not so uh, particularly uh, you know uh, Uh, the clinical parameters like uh, MCH uh, high risk prediction or MACIC uh, high risk prediction, early stage tumors and ETE present or absent are uh, observed to be uh, highly significantly associated uh, with the uh, uh, BRAP RAS uh, uh, cohort. Furthermore, independent of BRAS uh, BRAP RAS cohort. Uh, uh was shown to be you know surviving much poorer as you can see here mira pras uh, uh, cohort was surviving much better compared to the independent group and this uh, was again uh, pretty significant so uh, this indicates that uh, more detailed analysis of this uh, ibr group should be done to find out therapeutic target uh, which can be useful to improve the survival of this patient so overall from the study we get to see that uh, the ux2 uh, which is a, a well established uh, uh, germline uh, biomarker for uh, congenital hypothyroidism is observed to be associated with papillary thyroid cancer and it is also associated with advanced disease and poor prognosis uh, of ptc so this uh, can be a very important uh, uh, you know prognostic biomarker uh, for uh, papillary thyroid cancer and further we get to see that brap ras driven tumors are uh, characteristically different from uh, brap ras independent tumor and this ibr group uh, particularly shows uh, higher recurrence and poor uh, recurrence free survival uh, compared to the other cohort and uh, that uh, you know brings more attention to ibr group for you know uh, therapeutic uh, improvement uh, of this cohort <clears throat> so this is uh, 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 this is all about uh, you know uh, the thyroid uh, genomics so i hope you guys uh, have seen uh, you know basics of genomics and uh, uh, and particularly uh, its applications in uh, uh, thyroid study uh and uh, uh, in in you know uh, any of the future follow up if any one of you is interested uh, to dig more into how we perform all of these analysis or you know how we find out uh, uh, which are the hallmark alterations say for example here you get to see and which are the novel somatic alterations and out of novel how we Uh, you know uh, correlate and find out a biologically or clinically interesting alteration those uh, can be discussed further uh, but that is far beyond you know a single talk and uh, this microbiome uh, part is also uh, pretty complex we have some more data uh, suggesting that uh, you know uh, uh, this microbiomes can actually drive uh the tumor independently of uh, uh, you know any any other genomic alteration so if anyone of uh, you is interested uh, uh please drop a, a question in chat box or uh, you can contact me afterward so thank you dr pratik a wonderful lecture i think there was one question uh, which was sent to me that if you could summarize like what are the most common driver mutations i think you have been speaking long about it uh, just mm -hmm. a summary like what are the most common driver mutations in differentiated thyroid cancer particularly papillary ca and uh, where do we stand as clinicians uh, in their application mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in papillary thyroid cancer uh, brap and all the three ras which includes nras hras and kras are most common uh, most common as in that uh, it will 
cover you know more than 50% of the cohort of any uh, you know papillary thyroid cancer patients and uh, uh, these uh, uh, are all uh, potent driver ultrasounds so they do not need anything else to uh, uh, to drive the tumor growth apart from uh, uh, you know these uh, three <coughs> Let me highlight. So here are these things. Here is a mirror mutated cohort. So each each horizontal uh, line is a, a gene, and each vertical uh, line is a patient sample. And you can see here a uh, dark black color indicates roughly about forty percent of uh, uh, the cohort is mutated by uh, mirror. And uh, then about fifteen percent of the patients are positive for NRAS, and so on. So it keeps going down and down. Now here you get to see that roughly about uh, you know sixty percent, fifty five to sixty percent of papillary thyroid are solely driven by either BRAF or any of the RAS, which includes NRAS, uh, KRAS, or HRAS. So that's uh, the landscape of uh, papillary thyroid cancer. Now this DUX two uh, germline ultrasounds are sparsely present here, uh, covering total about eight percent of the uh, tumor samples in the somatic setting. and uh, many of them are independent of this ibr so they are present in the independent of uh, mira pras group so this dux2 is a next generation marker uh, for papillary thyroid cancer now if we look at uh, 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 medullary thyroid we get to see that red is a most common uh, driver ultrasound roughly about uh, you know putting 50% of the uh, tumor patients uh tumor cohort and uh, ras is also present in medullary thyroid at variable frequency we get to see here in ras keras and hras all of them are present at roughly about 10 uh, 20% frequency individually now here we get to see that in ras is always uh, you know co occurring with red ultrasound and keras and hras are always mutually exclusive to red ultrasound that is very interesting because this endras is uh, you know if we look at the uh, uh, cell line based study of different ras so these uh, oncogenic ultrasounds are very less potent compared to uh, keras and hras ultrasounds so this uh, these oncogenic ultrasounds are able to drive the tumor on its own it doesn't require any other support however these oncogenic ultrasounds are not uh, able to drive tumor on its own and they are usually Uh, co-occurring with other driver ultrasounds, which are you know more potent uh, 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 drivers. So uh, this is the common landscape of uh, red ultrasounds in the uh, medullary thyroid, followed by ras ultrasounds in the same disease. Apart from these two, uh, if somebody <coughs> needs to consider uh, any other uh, novel therapeutic uh, application, then BSN can be uh, considered as a next generation driver. Uh, uh, BSN mutations are also mutually exclusive to RET, and BSN uh, drugs have been recently uh, approved in all of uh, the tumors. So uh, this can be uh, biomarker for. thyroid so that that uh, covers uh, uh, the question right yes yes so i think uh, if there are no more questions thank you once again dr prati and we will conclude today's uh, lecture thank you sir okay thank you